We're very fortunate this evening to have two special young women with us. We have Anna from the Women's Freedom Center right here in Brattleboro. I'm going to read your, your bio if I can. Anna works as a women's advocate at the Women's Freedom Center here. This is a local organization working to end domestic and sexual violence in Wyndham County. Anna does both the direct service work at the center and is also the community outreach and education advocate. In her role as community outreach and educator, she facilitates a variety of educational workshops and presentations within the community that help to create dialogue and learning around the root causes of violence against women and the complex issues surrounding domestic and sexual abuse. We will listen to shortly. I just want to introduce also Chad Jones over here, who is a student at the SIT up in the road here that we have, the World Learning Center. She is working on her degree in international education and management. She's had lots of interesting experience in several fields. At, at present, I believe one of the most interesting that she will tell you about a bit is her creation of a group of women uh, to train them and prepare them for work in other countries around the world called, if I'm not mistaken, the Expat Women of Color. And we'll try to widen the discussion a bit. You see that we've been focusing on India. And we'll try to also bring the discussion back to our own country now as well, as we have many serious issues very close to our, our own doorstep. And then, uh, once the panel has discussed what they wish to present to you. Of course, we will welcome audience questions and participation. All right, Anna, thank you for being here. Would you like to say, make your sure. own statement about a few things? Yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, as Charles said, I am an advocate at the Women's Freedom Center. And so um, for those of you that don't know about the Women's Freedom Center, it was formerly the Crisis Center. Um, we work on domestic sexual violence. Um, and. You know, I see um, us being here as, you know, it's our responsibility to really bring this home. And so kind of using this as a jumping off point. And we together as advocates watched this and, and discussed it. And I think that half the sky, and I, I've seen a couple other segments too, um, half the sky got a lot of publicity and a lot of praise. And it also got a lot of criticism. And I think that's one of the, a couple things I want to point out. I think that Half the Sky is very well-intentioned in bringing to light um, these very important issues around violence against women and looking at countries that we may not see and, and really um, you know, bringing awareness and education around that. I think, however, one of the major missteps that is made um, with Half the Sky is that there's six segments, and they focus on the third world. Um, and they really could have also had a section on the US. Um, and if in not doing that, I feel like they sort of pushed it um, in sort of looking at that, you know, they talk about half the sky, but they're really only looking at half of the world. And really, they could have um, looked at sexism and violence against women in the United States also as another segment. And also that the U.S. is at times implicit in the violence that happens against women in other countries. Um, for instance, one of the things that is not pointed out um, with this particular issue is that the U.S. is one of the prime destinations for trafficking. So even just like having that information out too. Um, so that's sort of like what I want to kind of bring to the table is that when we're thinking about these issues, um, if we distance it, um, we also distance the suffering and we distance violence and we distance poverty, but it's really happening in our own community every single day and that here in Brattleboro we deal with these issues every day. Um, you know, and to think about bringing in the celebrity, um, which I think that ha it has pros and cons to. I think people recognize celebrities and that may draw them into watching it. Um, but even to point out that, you know, America is coming from LA where there is violence all around her and for her to like recognize that too and just to think, what are we doing in this country and what kind of miseducation is going on that, sh that she is sort of seeing 
violence in India is this separate thing where it's happening also in her own community and that you don't have to travel to go see that. Um, and that's not at all saying that it's not good to bring these issues to light um, and to really educate people on a global level about this, but it's really to connect it to also what's going on in the U.S. Um, the other thing I, I really want to point out is when I talk about, um, to just think about the notion of well-intentioned and how without putting a critical lens on it, um, it can really reinforce stereotypes or power dynamics. And the example I want to use in this particular segment is when um, Nicholas Kristof goes into one of the brothels with his camera and there's no sort of question about consent um, for asking these women if it's okay to come in. And I think that, again, I think it's well-intentioned. He's trying to shine a light on this. However, um, he is replicating a power dynamic. Uh, and to have a white male from the States to just walk into a brothel and talk to those women without asking them if they want their lives put on the spotlight and asking them about condoms is pretty problematic. Um, so it's really kind of like pulling out those and critically thinking about that, um, I, which I think is really important. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, and I'll turn it over <laughs> to you, and I also really want to hear what your reactions to this is, is that um, you know we do a lot in this community, and one of the challenges is really trying to engage people in this issue and to see how um, it affects them. And, what, you know, this, the statistic out there is that three out of four of us know someone who is affected by violence. So whether that's domestic violence or has been sexually assaulted. Um, one in four women in the U.S. Uh, experience domestic violence and one in five women um, in the general population experience sexual assault or rape um, in the U.S. So it's really to look at those numbers. We at the Freedom Center, we have a crisis line. We get calls every single day. Uh, we have women going to court every day. Um, and we also, one of the huge challenges in our work is how do we get people, because a huge issue around this is the stigma and the silence around it, and how can we get people to really engage? Um, because it is affecting us all, and we talk about really playing with language and looking at how it's continually called a women's issue. Um, and that it's not a woman's issue, it's really a human rights issue. And one of our major struggles is really engaging men because we talk about, um, we use gendered language saying ending men's violence and that is not to say that um, any kind of violence can happen, but the statistics show that 90% of perpetrators are men against anyone. So that's talking about against women, it's talking about against LGBTQ individuals, it's talking about men against men. And it's not anti-male to point that out. It's really to say what is going on that there's this huge um, statistic and what's going on in our society that's giving rise to this kind of violence. Um, and so that's also a struggle for us is how do we articulate that so that people aren't like, oh, I don't want to talk about that because that's not me. Um, and really to kind of expand that notion of what violence is in society and what it looks like. Stop right there. Um, I I too concur um, <laughs> because I enjoy this movie and appreciate this movie and I've read the book or portions of it and I've seen the whole entire movie and from my perspective it does have some great intention but then there are a lot of holes and gaps in the movie because it does just show overseas and Africa and India and mostly third world countries where there are, you know, like 100 to 150,000 young women in America who are sold into sex trafficking or given into sex trafficking here in the United States, around the corner, down the street, in D.C., L.A., New York. And so I think that is something that we really need to discuss, um, especially in this setting that we are looking at the world and from the view that 
oh, that's over there, and that's not here, and it doesn't affect us, when indeed it does. And there are young girls who are getting kidnapped, you know, walking to school or playing in their own backyards, and now they are now prostitutes or sold in big cities or, you know, gone to Vegas and become prostitutes right here where being, being taken advantage of and not having the opportunity to have a life here. And I think that for me, when I saw the movie and I saw every aspect of the movie, it saddened me that this is happening all over the world and that it is happening to women and that it um, didn't really reflect the, the things that we can do as humans to stop this issue. Um, I also agree with Anne with the fact that they did use a lot of um, celebrities, six celebrities, to go across the world. And I understand that the publicity in that and bringing more viewership and having the opportunity to get the following of the celebrities. However, um, in that, what about the protesters or the people who are actually in those brothels that are actually, or not in the brothels, but actually on the ground supporting women and making sure that they do have health care and different services, those people who need the bigger light. Um, they, they do go into different stories of women who are courageous like they do in the book um, and show a light on the things that they do. But I agree that bringing the celebrities into the mix, um, I only see the publicity in that. I don't really see how that actually um, helped or gave sus uh, sustainability to the actual issue. Um, for me, as a student and one that is going out into the world and having the dream to change it, I have to, for me, change where I am to change where I'm going. And so I look at it and I um, think about all the stories that I have seen personally and the things that I want to change at home as well, and I've lived abroad, and I've seen some things that hurt me, but at the same time, I also know that I can't change the world unless I change me, and so that there are some things that I am able to do and be empowered to do um, by showing the movie, by talking about the movie, by giving other women the opportunity, as well as men, the opportunity to discuss and have a forum or discussion. So this is the second time that I've actually seen the movie and actually been part of a panel. And it gives me great um, hope that looking at some of the issues, um, whether it be uh, sex trafficking or uh, genitalia mutilation, um, those issues are near and dear to my heart. And so um, I love to talk about the statistics because I have lots of statistics for the U.S. Um, and from uh, an international center, crisis and AIDS center in uh, the Midwest that did a lot of research and has a lot of research on some of the issues that are happening here. So as we go through the night. Um, hopefully I'll be able to give that information out and we can discuss that from how we can change things here, not just abroad and not just shine lights on things that are happening in different countries, but things that need to happen um, in Brattleboro or the next city or state. So hopefully we can do that. Thank you both very much for your opening statement. Uh, we'd like to hope that the intelligent citizen realizes that these problems are not just located in those countries. Um, I think one of the questions I raised, you know, initially with Anne at least, was you know, if I can ask you one or two things before I invite the audience in. What can we do as individual citizens 
and how do we raise public, public consciousness about these issues? And what, what resources do we have that we can offer them? These types of films, literature, what other kinds of things can you do besides public forums and the rest of it? Do either of you want to respond to that? Um, I think educating yourself first and foremost and educating the people around you about some of the issues. Um, I think a lot of times for Americans it's easy to turn on the television and distance yourself from the situation or the issue and <clears throat> you don't realize that one out of four girls is being uh, sexually assaulted or one out of five and you don't realize that 100,000 young girls every two minutes are being, or every two minutes a, a, a young girl is being abducted. So I think that you have to at least be aware. You have to at least research. You have to get involved. You have to actually try to understand the situations so it doesn't become something foreign to you. Um, you know, I know I came from the inner city where things like this happen all the time. And you saw young girls who one day was in school and you know, the next day wasn't in school, maybe got, um, there, there was a lot of inter-family um, prostitution. Um, and I grew up in the Midwest where it, it was a generational curse. And because one mother didn't have the education or didn't, you know, have the means to take care of their child, then allow their child to be in prostitution. And so it is something that I think we all have the ability to own for ourselves. And so we have to actually take it upon ourselves to do the research, talk, and, and actually have conversations about things like this. Um, you know, it's not just something foreign we have to take responsibility and I think that that starts with us and it starts at home and it, ha it starts having conversations in open forums and open places. Thank you. Anna, do you have a statement to add to that for instance? Um, yeah, I would just add, um, I mean I think there's lots of things that you can do and I think that um, I, the more I've done this work, the more community engagement type stuff I've done, it's been really interesting to see that this is something that affects us all in the sense that we all experience um, gender and gender socialization and um, issues around that. So if you think about, um, for instance, I did a, um, I do discussions at dental offices talking about the link between domestic violence and the dental profession. And what's been so fascinating to me about that is that we've, it's often become a total personal conversation because everyone can relate to these issues. So whether or not that's about like, I think for me what I always say is really expanding our understanding of what violence is and what violence against women is. So it's not, I think people go to sort of like rape or like physical assault, but if you look at that at like the end of the spectrum, think about like everything that kind of contributes to having something like that happen, that that doesn't just happen in a vacuum. So you're looking at gender roles, you know, you're looking at the media, um, you're looking at women being yelled at on the street, and it's really like thinking about all of that stuff and how, um, you know, if you have kids, like how do you teach your kids about relating to each other? Um, how were you taught? You know, I think about it a lot, like I do groups with women and we talk a lot about internalized oppression or internalized sexism. So there's so many things, it's so layered and we all can relate to it in different ways, however you identify. Um, and to look at it as we all have something to gain um, men have something to gain by ending violence against women. Um, and to like sort of looking at the gender binary and what does that do to people when you're put into sort of two boxes and that violence comes out of that. So it's really looking at it in a broader um, way and I think that that is even just the first step and sort of jumping on what you said is really, um, yeah, like looking inward and, and that educating and you know, even like attending events at um, 
like this. Like, I think that this is a great movie to watch because there's so many things to pull out um, in just this. And um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Why don't we give the audience a chance to get in here and see what is on your minds or what you wish to contribute to these issues as well. Anyone like to bring up something in particular or have specific questions for our panelists? Yes, please. I wondered on a very you know, kind of mundane level, because the film was huge and it raised issues that were so enormous that you know I can't even take them in. But I wondered, just on our local level, is there a role in the Women's Freedom Center for community members to volunteer to do something you know, specific, kind of free? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, because of the nature of the work um, and how the place is that it's uh, also a crisis center, it's hard to take volunteers actually in because um, of the confidential nature of the work and just the pace of the work at times. But we do, um, we have events throughout the year at, that we'll, that people can come and volunteer. Um, and I think more than even that is, you know, if you can't actually volunteer, is engaging with the issue and, um, we have the women's, I have a, actually a flyer and um, we have the Women's Film Festival coming up that happens every year in Brattleboro and um, that gives a platform to women um, who direct their movies by and about women, sort of the slogan. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a great event every year and it um, shows the diversity of women's lives. And, you know, that is, you know, people say, well, why a women's film festival? And, and again, this is like where I come in about like expanding sort of like the understanding of what sexism and violence against women is and how different things contribute. And if you look at the film industry, it's like 5% or it, the Hollywood film industry are women directors. So that is enough said. That is why we have a film festival that is just dedicated to women. Um, because it gives them a voice and a platform and that's part of the responsibility that we have as our organization. So it's coming out for that and, you know, we get comments like, oh, can men come to this film festival? And I just like laugh every time. That's like asking a woman if she can go to the movies. Like, it's like, yes, men can come. And it's like, I know it's a joke, but the man saying that, but it's just sort of like, it's, I think there's a lot of, um, stigma even around like a woman's center and you know that it's like anti-male or men can't engage it's not like that at all and one of the challenges we often talk about is how do we get more male allies because without men's voices at the table violence against women will not end so it's you know it's a big big question um, and besides that like it's I think it's we do a lot of education work in the schools. I do a lot of education with college age students. Um, and um, yeah, so I think it's like tapping into that and kind of even like thinking about this woman's issue as a, like even sort of reframing the language around it. I think that helps people get involved in it. Someone else. You said that you, the United States is the prime destination for sex trafficking? It's one of the prime destinations. Which means what? That sex slaves are brought to be imported into the United States? And what does yeah. that actually mean? So it means that um, young, of, most often young, um, and most often girls, are, um, I mean, when you think of the word trafficking, that means movement. Mm -hmm. So. You, you know, here they didn't talk a ton about trafficking. Um, it was more on prostitution. I mean, there's prostitution within trafficking, but they didn't, weren't focusing on that. Um, but that human beings are moved to different countries. And um, the statistic is something like 27 million people, human beings, are trafficked. Um, and 70% uh, or 80% of that is sex trafficking, and the other is forced labor. So we're getting a lot of forced labor into the United States, and we're also getting um, sex trafficking. Um, and the U.S. is one. It is, is it, it is not the top destination. It's one of the prime destinations. Um, and there's a website you can look at if you want more information on human trafficking. It's the Polaris Project. Um, and that gives you a ton of like statistics and explanations of what human trafficking is. 
Yes, please. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, say that I do definitely know that awareness precedes action. And so I do believe that there is um, value and worth and that there is a, a significant change that is made, although it might be intangible, and in just knowing about these issues that are going on and being able to view these documentaries. And so I'm very uh, grateful for this opportunity here. And just personally, um, I have been drawn to this uh, throughout, um, well, just I would say maybe the past five or six years, just this awareness of um, human trafficking, sex trafficking has come into, into my awareness. Um, there was a, a movie that was made, and this was back in 2005, I believe. I was still in school, and I remember watching this um, while I was in school, and it was talking about the reality of sex trafficking here in America, and I can't remember what it was called, but between the two of you, may, you may know, but I just cannot recall it, but it was aired on a broadcast television, and gyms in New York, mm -hmm. and I can't, yeah. I don't know what that you know stands that. for, but it was a, a woman who was a prostitute here in America, and she was able to rise up, and then she helped other girls who were caught up in prostitution um, to give them the support that they need to transition out of that lifestyle, and so that's gyms, and that's in New York, and um, and even with that, uh, it was a YouTube video that I saw, and then uh, later on, uh, when I moved to Vermont, I found on Netflix something that she had created or that was collaborated with her that got in-depth to the work that she was doing there in New York with Jim's. And, um, and that's J, that's G-E-M-S, Jim's, mm -hmm. I believe. And, uh, and then here, um, I was led to this as well. And it's just interesting, um, I was just learning a lot, uh, a lot of women's and, and girl empowerment and just coming aware of these issues. And it's, it's you're just right, it's not only, you know, in these other countries, I mean, it's right here. You know, it's right here in America, it's right here in Vermont, it's right here in Brattleboro. And um, I had somebody, a Braveheart Women is an online global community led by Ellie Drake, who is a doctor. She is from Iran, and she has her story of being wrapped up in oppression and coming up out of that. And she got me thinking about, you know, what's your global purpose? What's your professional purpose? What's your personal purpose? And I was like, my global purpose is, you know, helping to liberate folks who are oppressed. And then I went to my email and saw the, um, the I'm on the mailing list for the library here, and then boom, here it was. <laughs> you know, perfect. Um, it's important just to be aware. It does make a difference just to be aware. And to go off of that, I do think awareness comes before action. Um, and that is why the movie is actually good, you know, because it does make you aware of all these things that are happening around the world. But it also shines light on the things that are happening locally. It helps you to think about, okay, if there is intergenerational prostitution in India, why is that not possible here? You know, what can I do about that? Um, how can I volunteer um, at the Girls and Boys Club and make sure that young people at a very young age have options to create opportunities? Um, I think that is extremely important um, because it's our words, it's, it's the things that we instill within young people and children that make a difference because you can't create that action if you're not aware of the situation, if you don't have any inkling that there are girl, every, t I mean we've been sitting here for almost an hour and so and every two minutes there's somebody going into the sex trafficking world or arena that doesn't sign up for this, didn't, you know, come to this world to be destined to do that. And I think that it's extremely important to look around yourself and ask, well, what can I do? How can I help? How can 
I write a letter. How, I mean, and sometimes it's not a huge thing. You don't have to be a celebrity. You don't have to move mountains. But taking a step, um, making a phone call, uh, talking to a young person on the street or at the park, and you know, just getting them to alter their thought process, that's some of the action. And then, I mean, we all have computers at our hands. Sometimes, you know, we have these smartphones and they access the whole world of opportunity to make change. Um, you can create change right here where you are. And if you, you know, see a movie like Half the Sky and it gives you the opportunity to see what's happening around the world that gets you angry and moves your spirit to do something different, I think that does require action after that. And um, nobody can tell you how that happens. You have to want to, to, to make that happen. And I think, you know, the first step is to actually see something like this and then to actually question you and, and where you are. I think also I just want to say is, like, because I know, like, seeing a movie like this or, like, hearing statistics, it can be like, oh, my God, like, <laughs> it's so depressing or it's, like, so overwhelming and I don't know what to do. And, like, I mean, I've, like, totally had moments like that. And I think it's... Someone once told me, it's always stuck with me, is um, to be positive is a political choice. And I think that, like, like, because, you know, I work in this every day, and, um, you know, we hear stories and th see things every day, so we have, like, a lens on this. And But honestly, like, it's also to remember that people are doing amazing things every day, and that, um, you know, like what you said, it, it is also small things, like having a conversation with maybe your son or something and like talking about what masculinity is or um, like how you interact with people. I do work up at the colleges and it's also in an hour having a conversation um, and just talking with them about like what, how do we define rape culture and what it is and like trying to like shift that thinking a little bit. And those small steps, you know, it's a, we, the Women's Freedom Center really um, thinks of itself as a social change organization, and social change takes a long time. Like, we've seen that throughout history. And so if we get stuck on sort of like, oh, it's just too overwhelming, you know, that's when we become immobilized. But I think that if we can stay positive and see that great things, like, can happen, um, and, you know, even with my criticisms with Half the Sky, I do see that, you know, it's bringing attention to something that people would not have known about or seen. At the same time, I will say it's really important to keep that critical lens because that's how we make change. You know, so if it's for Nicholas Kristof to think about his role and like the power dynamic he also plays, that's important, you know. And I'm glad that he's brought this to the stage for people to look at. Um, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, please. Well, um, I, I think that um, a society kind of decides person by person and adds up, you know, what is acceptable in a culture. And so it isn't just the women who are the victims or who are pulled into these things. It's their other participants in this picture. Um, so we would have, I guess, the, the person who runs the brothel or whatever it is, or the person who um, makes available labor that's slave labor or whatever. Um, and then there's the customer who purchases the, the maid or whatever, or, or the prostitute. So um, I guess it's sort of a two-fold question here. So one is, I guess, we don't hear as much about the customer or the employer or mm -hmm. the, the middleman or whatever. Um, so I guess I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. And then the other thing, and not just the, the woman all the time, but the whole picture. The other is, um, what kind of protections are there in our society and how much of a priority is it for our legislators? How, how are they addressing it? Are, are, as a society, are we allocating enough funds to deal with these issues? Yeah, I'll just quick on that first question. I think that's a really awesome question. So I'll just, um, and for you to weigh in on this too, is that that was one of the things that I saw in that film is that they never look at 
um, that they're shining the spotlight on all these women, yet they're not looking at the perpetrators of this. And so I think that is a great question, that that should be happening. Um, and also, even one of the contradictions in this film that I find is a stark contradiction is that the um, movie, some of the um, people that have funded the movie, um, I'll just pick two of them. One is Nike and one is Ikea, both of which own sweatshops, um, which are extremely exploitative um, and cause major violence on women and children. So it's to look at that contradiction too. I would love if Nicholas Kristof interviewed the CEOs of Nike, you know, and to have that voice in there and say, what, like, you're, you have this film, yet you're also totally implicit you know, in violence that is happening in exploitation. So, and for that question too brings up that this is like nothing happens in a vacuum. It's looking at the economy, it's looking at globalization and having an analysis of also why are these countries poor? Why do these women feel like they only have these choices? Um, so I think that's, yeah, a great point. Um, just to go off of your first question. Um, your second question, I can't answer because I'm not sure what or how much money is being allocated. I do know that recently we had a class in D.C. and um, based off of uh, sex trafficking and, and talking to um, each individual congressman for um, our areas to lobby against some of the issues that come with sex trafficking and, and to make sure that they are aware that we as citizens don't agree with the fact that it's not being spoken about. Um, but to go off of your first um, question, I did find that, that it was very interesting that no men were actually interviewed or, I mean, and that's very difficult because if you are you know, a person and you are purchasing sex, obviously you're either doing it undercover or it's an issue that you have. And so that's not something that you are going to readily, you know, just say, hey, I'll, I'll be interviewed, you know, hey, talk to me. Um, but I think that, again, just that thought that we don't see that or we, we're not addressing that issue brings up something else that we must be aware about. And that is that we are responsible to educate our young people again, to say, you know, to a young man or to a young woman, why would this not be okay? You know, why would you want to purchase sex? Or how does this other person feel when they're being abused or put into a situation? And, you know, have those type of conversations. Again, I'm not in a third world country and I, you know, I can't only imagine, you know, how bad those situations are. However, being here in America and seeing the dynamics between um, men and women, boys and girls, and the conversations that are being missed at the table and even just asking some of our children you know, why it's not okay to call a woman, you know, the B word, or to disrespect a woman, or to have a woman disrespect a man, and how those things are often missed, and they create those other situations. And so, um, I, I find that very interesting that we, you know, shine lights on the problem, but not what created the problem. And that's extremely important. And we have to go back to the table and we have to educate the young people again. You know, it goes back to, because I'm a strong believer that, you know, after a certain point, you are who you are. But you have to go back to the young people who are coming up who are going to replace you at some point or another and make sure that they aren't making the same mistakes and that they are having conversations that they have not yet had and bring awareness to certain situations. We can't keep turning our back and saying, oh, that's over there or that happens to those people or 
that's just not happening here. When indeed there's somebody in a dark car driving down a dark alley and they're looking for action or something that they probably shouldn't be involved in. And why? So why is that person doing this? And how can we help that person? Um, and are they even aware that this might be a problem? So I think those are things that we, we, we have to address. I think that gets back to a, a question Anna brought up with the question of violence in society. We see it through the films, we see it through the whole media, we see it through video games, we see it through so many forms, and we should be seeking in many ways perhaps more active legislation to curb these types of presentations. So it was interesting in the film how they talked about sex trafficking and abuse of women happens more frequently in countries that have a lot of religious fundamentalism. And, you know, I think we've seen a rise of religious fundamentalism here, and along with it, the abrogation of a lot of the women's rights that had been secured that we see slipping away. Mm -hmm. So that I thought was a, an interesting um, corollary. And then also just the culture of war. You know, as a mother of a 14-year-old boy, I can tell you the pull toward the first-person shooter games is huge. And I mean, it's like a daily struggle for me. You know, and this is a kid that doesn't even use the games much, but everyone else is. And they're going and killing people, and it's it gets into their heads. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you feel there, you know, there's this sort of war culture that's being fed to the young people and perpetuated. Absolutely. But I will say that I do think there is also a fundamental problem talking about women and focusing on girls, because I bet that a, a large number of those being trafficked are young boys. And having known, you know, um, young men who've been abused, it's, I think, equally as rampant. It's violence against each other. I think when you start to isolate talking about women's abuse, you do lose half the audience, you know, for whatever reason. And it is a challenge to get to talk about it more as the fundamental vein of violence that runs through our culture toward everyone and the economic um, factors therein. Mm -hmm. But I think are even more powerful than gender. So it's, it's a complex issue. Yeah. I'm I'd glad like to that just we can respond talk to about that. it because of yeah. the film. <laughs> I just want to respond to that because it actually is the statistic that in sex trafficking it is 80% women and children. And when we say children, that is meaning young boys, um, but it is mostly girls. Um, and so it's not denying that violence can happen against boys and men. Absolutely, it does. Um, however, it is important to name that, you know, and look at the evidence, because evidence is what influences our language around this. And so just looking at the United States, like I said, it's one in four women, and it's one in five women are sexually abused or raped. One in four women um, experience domestic violence. In comparison to men, men, um, it's about one in 73. Um, experience sexual yeah. abuse, and that's I coming from the talk about it. Just let me finish, please. Um, <laughs> and that's coming from the Center of Disease Control. The other thing too is that when you talk about domestic violence specifically, 85% of victims are female. Um, I'm sorry, 85% is male perpetrators against their female partner. And the reason that we stress that, like in our organization, is again. Absolutely, violence happens against men, and violence happens against boys, absolutely. There's women on women violence also. The reason that we stress that stuff around the gender is, again, not to place the blame on men. It's to look at what is going on for men. What is going on in our society that gives rise to mostly male violence? Because also when you're looking at violence against young boys, the perpetrators are mostly men. And so it's really to like drive that home. Um, and the recent example I use for people to really look at is we look at the um, Newtown shooting. And one of the things that came out about that was a huge report on the last, um, in the last 30 years, there have been 62 mass killings in the United States. 61 out of 62 were done by a male. And so we're bringing attention to that because most people talk about gun violence and mental illness, which are absolutely important to talk about. Mm -hmm. But women also suffer from mental illness, and women also own guns. 
So it's to look at why is it 61 out of 62 male and why are we not talking about that? We need to talk about that. If it was 61 women out of 60, people would be like, what is going on for women? And so we owe it to our men to say, what is going on for you? Again, it's not saying like, oh, men are blah, blah, blah. It's saying, what is going on? You know, like, and that's the other thing is that most men don't rape people and most men don't go around hitting or shooting people. But most rapists are men and so it's, let's look at that and how do we help each other and how do we get that voice at the table. So I, that's just sort of what, like around that language, just to stress that and it's absolutely like violence happens against men and, and boys. So when you were given the statistics about the number of perpetrators, largely men and so forth, if those are based on US statistics, is there anything global that shows that that's a, a global record? You know, I don't. I don't have any global numbers. I have um, just pretty much the same numbers you have um, here in the United States. Um, but from from the information that I do have and, and the things I've seen, again, it has been you know men. Now, in some of these countries where uh, half the sky was actually filmed in. There are issues where there are brothels that are ran and owned by women. And those, I mean, you have madams, but then you have a, a brothel owner that has enforced um, sex on a group of women or bought and sold women, and she is, you know, the abuser. However, in most parts, the men are still like the, the people who carry the money and who enforce the beatings and all these other things. But again, I don't have any you know, statistics to go you know, um, or to, to talk about that. But that is an issue, and I think it's an issue worldwide, not just here. And I think it's like to ask yourself too, like the global statistic on women is one in three women experience um, some sort of abuse. Um, that's the global statistic. I think it's also just to like, because um, you know, I don't sit here and have all the statistics, statistics from other countries. However, it's to look at like the patterns and also to like, and this is you know a larger conversation about like where does the root of male violence come from? And one of the things we talk a lot about is um, looking at patriarchy and how society is structured. And so it's also then looking at other countries um, and that you know you will find that it my guess is that it is um, the pattern of statistics will stay the same that it is mostly male perpetrators and um, female victims again that violence is happening in all sorts of forms all over um, but I think it's really to look at that and also you know what we're saying and you had brought this up too is that um, or you brought that up about like questioning, um, like looking at who makes the rules, like who, like think about the U.S. government and, and how much, you know, we are involved in a couple wars and like thinking about where is that perpetration of violence coming from and who is making those decisions and then looking at other countries like that too and like for us to really like look into that um, because I can, you know, almost guarantee you that there is a there's a pattern to it, you know, and it's and the questions that we're asking here tonight are the same questions that should be asked of any country of where this violence is coming from and why is that happening? Because it doesn't happen in a vacuum; it's happening in conjunction with a lot or all social issues, you know. And I would even say that that statistic, the one in three, is probably lower. Um, it might be one out of two because in most countries, women don't even have the right to talk. Um, in most countries, women, um, it, the husband runs everything, and so they don't have the ability to speak up as we do. And oftentimes, we don't, even in this country, speak up as much as we should. So um, I'm almost convinced that the number is probably <laughs> skewed, and it's probably much worse than what we actually think and that's something that we still have to think about in a lot of countries women don't even have rights however um, even saying that 
there are so many countries where women actually are presidents and run countries where we haven't had that opportunity mm -hmm. here in the United States. So. I had noticed, uh, my wife and a friend or so had noticed that conspicuously lacking from this uh, were the Mideastern countries. Not one of them was really addressed, oddly enough, in this documentary. Mm -hmm. And while I would like to go on, I know that we're about to get the signal to start clearing things up. We have to be out by 9 o'clock before the alarm sets. <laughs> and I, I just, you know, before we close, I wanted, I was going to, we were going to offer you some tea and cookies. <laughs> and I, I guess you might want to do something about, about the raffle. I can get in one or two more comments. And before we leave, I want to thank our, our very eloquent and, and well-informed panel members very much, as well as everyone else who helped us sponsor you. Um, I just have a quick announcement. Real, the, on the table over there, there's our brochures. It also had the, has the Women's Film Festival um, little thing. Where it has like the schedule on the back. It will link. You can look at our website, and you'll find information about all the movies. The other thing, just since we're sitting here talking tonight, is that in April, and um, we'll publicize it all over, is that I'm going to do a showing of The Invisible War, which is a documentary that was just recently made. It's about sexual assault in the US military. Um, so if people are interested, it's a difficult documentary to watch, but it's again one of those subjects that um, really needs to be, like, have a light on to look at what happens in the U.S. military because sexual assault in the mil U.S. military is one in three. And they say that women in the U.S. military are more likely to be raped by a fellow um, military member than to be killed in war. So it is an absolute, like, rampant problem that's been in the news lately. Um, so look um, if people are interested just to know that that's coming up in April in, at the library. And thank you all for coming tonight as well. We appreciate your attendance and hope we'll be back for more independent lens films.